Welcome to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by my man, Audley Stevenson, the odd man. He'll unpack wisdom and insights from a cross-section of top quality performers in business, media, sports, entertainment, and lifestyle to uncover key elements to help you live your best audacious life ever. So without further ado, here is The Odd Man. Greetings and salutations. I'm Audley Stevenson, and you're watching or listening to the Audacious Living Podcast. Of course, this is a podcast that helps you live your best audacious life ever. And I want to say thank you to everyone joining in. Either you're listening or watching, I appreciate you uh, for taking the time and spending some of your time uh, with us today. Uh, another big show coming up. Uh, we're talking about dreams and the power of dreams and chasing after them and why that's so important. Our featured guest is Spider Jones. Uh, for those who are familiar with him, uh, he, of course, is a motivational speaker, big time youth speaker uh, here in Toronto for the last 20 years or so. Uh, he's been lending his voice to young people and encouraging them how to dream. Uh, he is a former Golden Glove boxer. He's a nominated in the Canadian Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, and as well, he was a former radio personality. So Spider is going to spend some time talking to us about uh, not only just dreams, but his life, his upbringing. Uh, he had some severe challenges uh, that made the road a bit rougher for him. So he talks about what he did to overcome that and then how he's used, how he's used that uh, to help young people. Um, but before we get into Spider, I want to get to a, a very important quote today. Uh, it's a personally imp one that's personally important to me because uh, it comes from a friend that who I lost a few years ago, uh, back in 2014 to be exact. Uh, my good friend Rick Sovereign uh, succumbed after a lengthy battle with cancer. Uh, he was a pro golfer, a husband, a father to two great daughters, Kristen and Kelly. Uh, and again, just a great, great guy, highly inspirational. Uh, and I, I miss him sadly. Uh, but And this is one of the reasons why I thought it'd be fitting to share his quote as we're talking about dreams, because uh, the quote from Rick uh, goes like this. He once said that a dream pursued is a dream fulfilled. And it's so important that we understand this quote because nowadays there's such an emphasis placed on that final outcome and not as much value is put on the journey, that process, the steps that we get to that dream. There's more attention paid to did my dream come true? And it's not that it's, 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 it's absolutely important. Please don't get me wrong. But that process to get there, there's much value in that, and it can never be forgotten. And that's why a dream pursued is a dream fulfilled. You know, I talked about Rick being uh, so highly motivational, inspirational. Uh, you know, he was an encourager to so many people, myself included. Um, for those of you that know, I've been the commissioner of the National Basketball League of Canada since 2017. Uh, I was appointed unanimous, unanimously by the board of directors. But the crazy thing is that Rick actually had envisioned me in that role five years prior. It was in 2012 when he first came to me and he said, you know what? I could see you doing well in that role. I could see you one day running this league. And it certainly caught me off guard because I wasn't, th I w my, my headspace wasn't there, but he could see it. And, and, and that was his gift. He could see things in people and bring them out. Um, you know, we, we first met when uh, our, our daughters played basketball together and that was his, basketball was his love. And he loved coaching, he loved teaching the game and he loved giving options and helping expand their players' uh, uh, knowledge and skill sets beyond what they currently understood it to be. Uh, so this is very much him and how he did things. So when he came to me and said, you know, what he could see in me, he planted that seed. Uh, and, 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 and was ready to watch it grow, but 
It wasn't about watching it grow, and that's not what he did. He actually watered and nourished it through his encouragement. You know, we spoke often, uh, almost weekly, uh, we talk about this dream of me one day being the commissioner of the National Basketball League of Canada. You know, even ha- as his sickness worsened and, and the cancer became more and more uh, developing, developed worse and worse in him, he still was that encourager and was still saying, you know, I could see this and was giving ideas and feedback and thoughts and all the things that I could do to help meet this dream. Again, you know, he passed away in 2014. And, you know, and on one hand, you know, we could say it was sad that he actually wasn't there to see me fulfill my dream. But, you know, in, in retrospect, uh, you know, Rick saw something in me long before I realized it myself. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, he really didn't need to see me in the role because he already did. Rick, thank you. Spider Jones is an award-winning journalist, a three-time Golden Glove champion who was inducted into the Canadian Boxing Hall of Fame in 1996, and a sought-after motivational speaker who uses personal stories from his challenging upbringing to motivate and inspire today's youth. His legendary broadcast career has seen him interview notable celebrities such as Muhammad Ali, former U.S. President Bill Clinton, Mark Wahlberg, Jesse Jackson, LL Cool J, and so many more. Jones is an energetic advocate for Believe to Achieve, which is a youth outreach program he founded to help inspire young people to dream big beyond their present circumstances, which is a pattern of living that's given him much success. Spider Jones is truly an inspirational figure, and he's up next on the Audacious Living Podcast. Uh, Spider Jones, thank you for being on the podcast. Hope all is well with you. It is. Well, and, and, and thanks for having me on. It's great to be with you. Much appreciated. You know, uh, uh, much of our, our time on this podcast, we really talk about, you know, audacious living and living that bright, bold, audacious life. And when I think about over your, your, your career and all that you've done, I think you, you've definitely done that. Um, having both, you know, you, and I heard you talk about having dream careers, both in boxing and in broadcasting. Um, that's got to feel good when you reflect on that, huh? isn't it? Well, I would say... In broadcasting, it was a dream come true, and boxing was a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> boxing's a hurting game, and uh, I think the reason I I got into boxing was my father uh, forced me to get into boxing because I was getting beat up and bullied a lot as a young as a right. young kid, and I mean I'd come home every night with a bloody nose or bruises, right, crying like uh, you know. And my father finally said, I- I'm tired of this. So he took me to a gym and I uh, began to box. And I found that I, I was pretty good, but I didn't have the kind of passion. Right. I'm not going to say heart, but the kind of passion to take it all away because boxing is an individual sport. And, right. Uh, and and you got to be uh, you got to be ready. You got to be so hungry that you can take that hurt and that pain and and do all that sacrificing it takes to reach the top level. But uh, I participated at the amateur level for many years and uh, and, 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 and did well. Right. Uh, you know, but uh, it, it opened a lot of doors for me, oddly, because sure. I met a lot of people in boxing that furthered my career, such as Muhammad Ali and, of course, my, my dear and oldest friend, George Chevallo. Yeah. Who opened so many doors for me. Yeah, yeah. Talk, talk, talk about Ali and what that, did, what that, what, I, what he was like. I mean, he was a larger than life character individual. Um, he, he had a way of touching people, uh, as, as you know, in, in incredible ways. And so, sort of talk about what, what he did for you and how he impacted you as a young man. Well, Ali impacted me long before I had the wow. opportunity of meeting him. I mean, he impacted so many people. I think the first day is funny because. When I first really heard of Muhammad Ali, was when he won the uh, light heavyweight Olympic gold medal right. in 1960 in Rome. And I remember him being interviewed, and, and that's so many years ago. I mean, I was, I, was, uh, uh, I was only about 17 or 18. Right. But I remember him during an interview that, uh, when they began, the Italian press began to ask him about all the racial problems in America. 
And of course, him being from the South, from being from Louisville, Kentucky, right? He uh, he told him, "Well, don't worry about our country. We still live in the greatest nation on earth." And they don't tell you that. And he said, "We got qualified people working in them area." So that was, was kind of cool. Right. I remember he turned professional and he was beating, winning all these fights. But to me, he was just a blown up, a blown up light heavyweight. Okay. And and then he fought a friend of ours from Detroit, by the name of uh, Sonny Banks. Mm-hmm. And and Sonny Banks was this guy they were building up to be the next Joe Lewis. He was also from Detroit. As Sugar Ray Robinson was, and yep. then later Tommy Hitman Hearn. Exactly. And, and uh, we were all for Banks. And everywhere you went in Detroit at that time, there were all these posters all over. Then they used to put them on the telephone. Yep. Yep. The, window, uh, the new uh, uh, the new Joe Lewis. So, man, we're watching that that fight. And I said, this guy ain't going to beat Sonny. Heck, man, Sonny Banks hit too hard for him. Yeah. And he said he had made a prediction that he was going to knock uh, uh, Lucian, uh, Lucian Sonny Banks out. Right. In, I believe it was in the fifth round. And so in the fourth round, Banks drops Alley. That's a quiz question. Who's okay. the first fighter to put Alley down? It was Sonny, Sonny Banks. Lucian Banks. Okay. I said, see, I told you I was at my uncle's barber shop in Detroit. <laughs> and he knocked Alley down. I said, it's over. Alley got back up, and, and I got to tell you, he was like a lion going after a, a lamb. He just went into him, and that's what I said. Wow, look at this guy, because look, man, yeah. anybody can get knocked down. And yep. I use that as a metaphor for life. Anybody can not get knocked down, but the great ones get back up and into the fight, just like Joe Frazier did, uh, like uh, Muhammad Ali, like Sugar Ray Leonard, like Rocky Marciano. All the greats got knocked down, but they got back up into the fight. Right. And I think of them, I think of Evander Holyfield and guys like that. Sure. And, and, and so... I started to watch this guy and listen to him and, 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 and began to listen to the way he, he began to, he stood up for the brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And I began to admire him. He was a man of his conviction. I loved that. This is long before I met him. I, I, he became larger than life because he was a black man speaking up and telling the establishment, right. I'm not going to fight uh, in a nation I never heard of. Well, I can't. You won't fight for me and my nation. Right. You treat us like second-class citizens. Mm. He stood up to him, knowing he was going to go to prison. Yep. And they offered him a way out because they they, they just wanted to get him out of the way. Right. They offered him a way out. They said, look, you do what Joe Lewis did. Do what the rest of them did. Go into the Army. We'll, we'll make it easy on you. All you have to do is do exhibitions. Yep. Right, and all the... Uh, uh, the stations and all over the world, and I said, "No, I'm not doing any of that stuff." Mm-hmm. And 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 so he 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 was uh, his living was taken away from him, but he was a man of conviction, right? Strong conviction. Yep. He still would not give in, and and that you know that's the, you know when you believe in something, yes, you have to you have to hang in there with it, and so that's what he did. And I got to tell you something, I look. As great as Ali was, as great as his accomplishments were, he never fought in his prime because he was taken away from them. Right. 26 yep. to 30 are the yep. prime years, the most effective years for a heavyweight. Yep. And he yep. lost those years and he lost millions of dollars. So, and, and, and when he came to Toronto, it was 1966, uh-huh. and I had just come out of... Um, uh, jail. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did some time at a place called Millbrook. Yep. And I was living at Sully's Gym on Ossington. Okay. And the phone rang one day, and it was a guy named Donnie Album. Okay. Who uh, worked with Don King. And he, he wanted to talk to Sully. Right. So Sully gets off the phone after and tells me that Muhammad Ali's coming to Toronto. He's fighting George Chevallo, and he's going to be training. At Sully's gym, which That's at good. the time was at 109 Osmond. Right. And he said, don't say nothing to the press. 
<laughs> uh, because we want to, you know, they want to announce it. Sure. And so it happened. And I got to tell you, to this day, it was ele- as electrifying as winning the NBA championship. I mean, the people. The people, wow. They came from all over. I remember the first day I came back, Ellie arrived. I had been out all morning doing whatever I was doing and doing some road work. I, to, I do my uh, three or four miles a day in Hyde Park. Right. And I noticed as I walked up Arlington Street towards the gym, mm-hmm. which was halfway between a Queen Street and, and, and Dundas. Yep. All these big cars parked on each side of the street. License plates, Ohio, wow. uh, uh, Illinois, Michigan, yep. uh, uh, Quebec. Ontario, uh, wow. uh, New York, all the big rollers had 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 uh, reached into Toronto to see uh, yep. the Louisville Lip. Yeah, to catch a glimpse. Yeah, to catch a glimpse. As I got up the stairs, as I as I arrived at the gym, the lines were just jammed back. I think they were charging a dollar or two dollars to see him train. Oh wow! And I got into the gym, and it was jammed. And because I lived there and trained there, I got behind the the, uh, the area that was cordoned off. Okay. And I spotted Angelo Dundee right away. You know who Angelo Dundee is, the great trainer of George okay. Trump, yes. of Muhammad Ali, right. Sugar Ray Leonard. Yeah, famous Michael trainer. Brano, Carmen, he trained all these yep. great fighters. Little Italian guy, about five foot five. <laughs> and um, we, got the, we, we got in a conversation... He was very, uh, 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 <laughs> I guess he was surprised that I knew so much about him. Right. And I said, you think I could meet the champ after? He said, yeah, we'll set that up. So Ellie comes out of the dressing room after. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and there's Joe Lewis is with him, and there's uh, Big Jim Brown and all these guys. I believe Cosell was there, too. Mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. I, I believe Howard Cosell was there. Okay. But at any rate, he walks over to the crowd, and he, they start chanting, Al Lee, Al Lee, Al Lee. And he's kissing babies and kissing people on the cheek and joking around with the press. And, and then he walks over towards us, and I'll never forget the first time I met him because Andrew Dunn come on and meet Spider Jones. He's a Golden Glove boxer. Come on and meet him. So Allie walks up to me and mock, mock, uh, uh, had that look of mock intimidation on his face. Right. He says, well, you think you bad or something? I knew right away what he was doing, and the crowd was into it. And it was an honor, he said to me. And I said, um, no, I'm not, I don't think I'm bad. I, I'm just bad enough to keep the bad cats off me. <laughs> he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to whip you, Spider Jones, in front of all these cameras. The world going to see me whoop you. <laughs> and I knew right away what he was doing. Everybody was eating it up. Play up the cameras. Allie was being Ali, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's what he was doing. And so I sort of slowly took my, 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 my coat off. I had a leather jacket with three-quarter length. Mm-hmm. And he ran and hid behind Angel Dunny and said, Angie, don't let him hurt me. I'll bleed all over you. <laughs> and the crowd ate it up, and I ate it up. And that's how I got my first little amazing. rally. Amazing, amazing, amazing. You know, you, you, you talked earlier and you gave the, illustra- the, the illustration of, you know, the great fighters and they go down and, you know, they don't quit and they get back up. And, you know, a guy like Ali and many fighters, there's all sorts of great lessons that you learn from them when they, the way they live their lives. We, we recognize that now, but in the moment, did, were you, did you identify those those lessons or was it something that came to you later on? Hell no, I was too humiliated. <laughs> I mean, you get knocked down in front of five, six hundred people, a thousand people, man. You know, your girlfriend's in the crowd or your wife. Man, that that that. hey, man, I've been boasting and talking. I didn't do a lot of bragging, but, you know. It, 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 I didn't get knocked down that many times. My legs kept my chin out of trouble a lot, you know. Gotcha. But, uh, gotcha. Uh, getting knocked down, uh, it, it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. Uh, but getting back up and in the fight shows courage. Listen, you climb in the ring, I, I, you know, you lose a fight. You got courage. It takes a lot of courage to climb in the ring and fight. I don't care if you're good, if you're if you if you're a lousy fighter. You keep climbing in that ring. That takes courage, man. Right. It's, it's a life's lesson. You never give up. If you really believe that this is your dream, that this is your aspiration, this is your future, then 
you can't give up. So boxer, what boxing taught me was to be mentally tough. There we go. It taught me discipline. When I first trained, I couldn't hit the bag for a round, let alone three minutes. And then boxing, you learn that uh, that uh, you know there's ups and downs in the game, and you got to you got to sacrifice. And I wasn't willing to sacrifice enough. My father used to say to me all the time when I would say, "Maybe I'll be a champion one day. Maybe I'm going to be this big time singer. Maybe I'm going to be this and that." He said, "You know what, son? You got a lot of skill, a lot of talent, but you know." There right. a lot of other kids who come through this door. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. die. And yeah. It took me years to translate that. Right. If you want it bad enough, then you have to be willing to sacrifice. Because if success came easy, yep. everybody would be successful. You got it. You got it. You got it. So you, t- you, t- you touched on dreams. I think that's a really good point. Uh, really the topic when we, because everyone dreams, right? Like you said, everyone has dreams. Everyone wants success. Uh, the biggest obstacle in your view, what, what do you think why people, more people don't go after their dreams? I think uh, a lot of people don't have that sense of self-worth. Maybe they don't have that mental muscle to overcome the obstacle. Dreams aren't easy. Right. And when you're pursuing a dream, many people, because you run as an obstacle, a challenge, or a rejection, or, or a fail, they believe that uh, maybe it's not meant for me, or they give up too easy. Right. That's the problem. They give up too easy. Hey, listen, you, as they said in the Rocky movie, everybody was a contender. Every, I mean, every champion was a contender first. Right. Before yeah. you became the champion, you are the champion of your dream. I tell young people every day, don't be intimidated by your dreams. You own that dream. That dream is yours. Right. You control that dream. Don't let that dream con- intimidate you. So right. you have to be mentally tough. And, and and many people just don't feel the worth it, especially when you come from low-income families or you come from the projects. Or, for me, there are a lot of different reasons. I, I mean, you... I had a learning disability. You know. mm-hmm. I failed grade three and grade four, and they put me in a, a, a remedial class for slow learners. Okay. It's called a special ed class. Yep. The rest of the kids called it the ding dong class. Mm-hmm. And I began to feel this. You, you, I bought into this. I thought okay. I was stupid because I, I didn't process my information at the same rate as somebody else. Right. I bought into that. And so many young people today buy into that. The prisons are full of them. Right. Full of young people that, that they got talent. They're intelligent. Just because your learning process right. doesn't, uh, isn't as rapid. It's as different. It. Yes. We have to understand that. It's, maybe in the education system works like that. But it's a, uh, you know, in real life, man, we have different uh, levels of, 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 uh, of, of, of processing. Yes. Well, you're absolutely right. And I think also, too, the edu- there's the onus on the education system to recognize that people learn in different ways and they understand in different ways. And, and how do you cater to that? How do you manage that? Because if you can tap in to a young person the right way, then, you know, you can open up all this seed of potential inside of them. And I, and I know you, uh, through your foundation, how much uh, you support young people through Believe to Achieve. Sort of talk about sort of the work that's doing to help uh, young people be better. Uh, it's, it's, it's a project very close to my heart. My wife and I co-founded uh, Believe to Achieve many years ago. About yep. 20 years ago because I thought, you know, all, you, all these young people do is, is you need is to be empowered. They need to be loved. They need to be mentored. They need someone they know cares about them. And many of these kids I deal with come from immigrants, but not all. Many of them are born and raised here, but they have uh, uh, they come from areas where they don't have the same opportunities. Maybe they don't have the computer at home to do their homework. Right. And I thought, you know, in 1993, I got a call from a school teacher. I was going, I was on the fan then, uh, and I was yep. going coast to coast, and it was out there that I uh, I had a, a past. And I never tried to hide it. Right. Or conceal it. And I got a call from a school teacher one day who says, uh, who asked me if I would come out and speak to his children. I believe it was at Central Tech. It could have been Central Commerce. 
Right, downtown Toronto there, yeah. Yes. And I thought, well, what am I going to say? Despite what you talk about how you changed your life, wow. how you're living your dream, you've said it many times. Talk about it. Share it. Tell them everything. Tell them about your jail time. Tell them about, about, about how the road left you. I mean, which, uh, how you took the wrong road at first and got involved in, in criminal activities. And so I came out to the school, and I spoke in front of an entire auditorium for the first time. And as I got into it, uh-huh. it was almost like a spiritual development happened. I began to think, I looked at them young faces, and I thought, I want them to have a better life than I did. Right. And I want them to know the joy of living your dream, whatever it might be. Uh-huh. I wanted them to know that, so I began to talk to them, and, and, and they could see the possibility that if someone came from where I was at, right? I, what do you, I went to bed till I was 14, I went to prison, I failed grade three and four, I hated myself, I had this self-loathing, I was bullied and picked on, and a lot of it was racial too, believe me, the racial oh. tension back yeah. then. Yes, it was, yeah. And, and it even kept you. From prevented you from following your dream of that going on in the media today. I will say that that's a, maybe another story, but the fact is, I became the first black man to go coast to coast on Canadian radio, and that didn't happen until the 90s. And I remember I'd go to these um, uh, uh, conference, I mean, uh, press conferences, and yeah. it'd be strange at first. What's this black guy? What do you know about hockey? <laughs> I'm one of the bro- bro- brothers that loved hockey. <laughs> I've always been a boxing fan, a hockey fan. Yeah. More than anything, I love boxing and I love hockey. Because I love the, the fisticuffs, the pugilistic aspect of it. And anyway, I'd be at these, these press conferences. The only thing blacker than me was the puck. But people, <laughs> after a while, they got to understand that, look, man, this guy's a warrior. Sure. You know, like hockey players, see, they are, so they gave me, but they gave me a lot of leeway because this guy's a, a boxer, so we right. know, you know, we ain't gonna bully him around. Or, and I was very outspoken, but I enjoyed the game. And, 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 and I told these kids all the stories about how I finally turned my life around. It wasn't easy. I had to go back to school at 35. And I got, and so about a, a week later, I get a call from the same teacher who said, Do you mind if I pass your, your number out? And I said, uh, Yeah, but why? He said, Because there are a lot of people that want to. You to come out to your schools and be phenomenal. Well, I knew it. I'm going to schools when I start getting calls to come into the prisons. Wow! And uh, it started a whole new career as a is a, 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 a an inspirational or a motivational speaker. Wow! But, but I thought, you know, oddly, I'm out here inspiring these young people. It's like lighting a flame, but right. you have to nurture. Right. You have to feed your passion. Because right. it's like a creative spirit in you. If you let it wither away, that's what it'll do. It, it right. causes resentment, regret, sure. uh, uh, even depression. Sure. Because a dream, it, dreams are from the heart. And you can't suppress what you love and what comes from the heart. And so I started speaking to these kids about this. And I, and I, and I said, I got to start. We have to open a center somewhere. Right. Because we need to nurture kids. And, and that's when I uh, started being associated with, uh, with a, a very wonderful family who owned Greenwind Property Management. Okay. Uh, the Green family. And I met Kevin Green and his brother Eric. And we had this conversation. And the next thing I know, they offered me a spot for a dollar a year. Okay. So I got the center up there, the Spider's Web Youth Empowerment Center. Wow. And I wanted to call it uh, uh, Empowerment Center because that's what it is. I wanted people to be very clear. This is not a baby glorified babysitting center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to come in here. We're going to help you evolve. We are going to empower you. We had kids come in there that were special uh, education that we, when we, when we, they be, after a while with us, because of our homework club, they got into regular grades. Wow. Yeah. It's been open now about 12 years and we've taken children out of gangs. They've come to us. I've had young people come to me and, and say, I, I, I want to be part of this. Right. 
and thanks right. to Union Property Management and, uh, and and we've raised a lot of money to Bay Street. Yep. All for the center. And we have a wonderful crew of people there, a wonderful team, believe to achieve team that is uh, that are committed solely to <clears throat> to empowering young people of all colors, not just black. That's amazing. Hispanic, yep. Uh, Asian, Muslim, yep. white. Yeah, and we, we, we practice a lot of things, including racial harmony. We want, we know, on this little mud ball flinging through space, we're all trapped here. We got to learn to get along, and we're not we do. doing a very good job of it. We do. No, you're absolutely right, and I, I love to hear the inclusion and uh, the way that you're making a difference in lives. And I mean, really, and, and you sort of talked earlier about uh, that creative energy that's within us, and by not tapping that, you know, we're we're holding ourselves back. So it's it's wonderful to hear that uh, you know you it's like a, a wet rag, and you squeezed everything out of it to make sure <laughs> that you maximized your full potential, Spider. So. That's certainly a certain congratulations for that. Let me just show you something here. Yeah, yeah, what you got there? I'm going to clog this. Can you see it? Yes, yes, out of the, out of the dreams. Yeah, that's right. Is your book Out of the Darkness? It'll be a yeah. movie soon. Oh, wow. And if they, anybody watching this would like to get a copy, it's a great book. I think every young person should read it. And, and uh, it's called Out of the Darkness. And they go to my website, spiderjones at rogers.com. Yeah. You can you can buy it there. It makes a, a a great gift. But I'm finishing my second book. Listen, oddly, I got to tell you this. Sure. Uh, I've always had a thing. I've always had this saying: as long as you're living, you got to keep giving. As long as you're breathing, you got to keep believing. I'm in my 70s and I'm still going strong. Thank God. I thank God for that. Uh, but uh, I work out. I stay in shape, and I still work with young young people, and I've been blessed with, with, with the gift that I can communicate with people of all ages. That is so important. You, and you've maxed, like I said, you, you've you squeezed that rag out. You you So you've used that. And I got to tell you that the young guy on the cover of that book looks the exact same way you do now there. That's awesome. Oh, you're being too kind, man. I, that, that picture was taken 20 years ago, but uh, <laughs> thank you for this. <laughs> Can't see a difference, Spider. Can't see a difference. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we, uh, uh, you know, the world, uh, we, especially this pandemic, we're still, sure. uh, we've had a couple of great uh, food drives, and uh, yep. we have them all the time, by the way, and we've had toy drives. Our kids are going to enjoy a good Christmas, and oh, everybody's going to eat well. Amazing. But the trick is with these young people is to help them develop that self-confidence. It does not matter where you come from in life. It's where you're going that counts. And oddly, too many young people are embarrassed. They really want to tell you, oh, I come from Jane and Finch, or I come from Chuck Farm. Be proud of where you come from, man. There are a lot of good people come up from the areas and did very well in their life. That's look right. At Detroit. Look, I grew up around the Detroit area, man. We had, we, we look at Smokey Robinson, Dinah Ross, all came from poverty. And look what they did with their lives. You know? Oh, man, so many. So many, I tell them, share so many stories of people like Viola Davis. Man, look at one of the greatest actresses of our time. Right. She went through hell growing up. Right. She was just somebody in Otley. You're not born extraordinary. You become extraordinary through an extraordinary effort. Mm. And that's important that young people know. Spider, say that one again. Say that one again, because that's a big one. Say that one again. And Oprah was not born extraordinary. Viola yep. Davis wasn't born extraordinary. Uh, 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 Tupac Shakur wasn't born extraordinary. Whoever you look up to, Beyonce, they weren't born extraordinary. They became extraordinary through an extraordinary effort. In other words, they were focused in like a laser. They first of all, you got to know what you want in life, mm. and then you got to go after it. No excuses. Nobody right. said it's easy. Some people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Other people have to struggle, as I did, for everything. That, look at my friend. Look at our friend Dwight Drummond. Right. Yeah. Dwight Drummond, an anchor man, grew up at Jane and Finch, had nothing. Georgie Strombolopoulos, my producer for years, came from came from nothing. Right. It goes on and on and on, and and and. But you've got to want it. Yeah. Because uh, and, and so, if you don't want it, then just stay out of my way and let me go. That's it. You got it. 
I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't touch on your, your extraordinary broadcasting career. Uh, you, you had an opportunity to in- interview uh, some fabulous people. And uh, you think of the, the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton, as an example, uh, plus many others. Uh, you, when, you, when you sort of reflect on your career, you talked about your dream. I mean, you gotta, I'm sure you got to pinch yourself sometimes, Spider, when you think about all that you had an opportunity to do. It's funny, I started, that dream began when I was uh, young. I, I, I became addicted to music because I, uh, I went through a very traumatic experience when my little brother died. He was 18 months old and I was five months old. I mean, I was f- five years old and I remember that night is what was yesterday because I remember my mother uh, uh, waking up with this, this, this horrific scream and I... Uh, Woke up, I was sleeping in a bed. Five of us slept in one bed, by the way. Right. And we were very poor. It was only two bedrooms uh, with nine children and my mother and father. All the years that, all the years that I lived at home, I, they never, they never had their own bedroom. They slept on a pull-out couch. And I remember my mother. I, I woke up uh, and, and there's my mother holding my, my brother's lifeless body. He was 18 months old. He had died in pneumonia. Right. And a couple hours later, this elderly-looking man, and I mean, he looked like he was out of a Hollywood horror movie, came in with a black bag and took my brother's body and just stuffed it in that bag like it was, like it was nothing. But from that night on till in my late teens, I, I struggled with, with nightmares like you wouldn't do, horrific nightmares. Right. I couldn't sleep well. Uh, so my mother would leave the radio playing every night. Mm. And I'd listen to all these great singers, Etta James, Nat King Cole back then, you know, the great names, Billy Eckstein, and, and all these great singers back then. And, 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 but more than that, I was electrified. I mean, I was just moved by the voices of these, these, these radio personalities right. that talked about them. And then when I was 10 years old, my cousin took me to the Fox Theater in Detroit. And I'll never forget, there were only four or five rows in. I didn't know how my cousin did it, but <laughs> I know that him and he had a crew. I didn't know what a crew was. I was 10 years old. Right. These were, these were stone gangsters, man. They were OG gangsters. Got you, got you. Detroit, and, and we were, uh, the guy that ran the, the, the theater used to cut deals with these guys to keep them from fighting in there. Gotcha. Uh, 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 there was a, there was a, there were no there were zones where the, they they had these truces and they kept them. Yep. Come with my cousin and them and this this little white disc jockey comes out. His name was Alan Freed. M R E E D. Alan Freed was very famous because he loved the brothers and sisters. Right. And he played their music and he called it roll and rock with white music. So he coined the phrase rock and roll. Gotcha. Wow. And he got so so big that they took him from Cleveland to New York City and he went coast to coast like buttered toast. And he was my guy to watch him. And that night I saw him introduce uh, Richie Valens, the first Hispanic yeah. to have a number one hit with yeah. uh, La Bamba. La Bamba, yep. And O'Donna. And they had Buddy Holly. These are legends. Chuck Berry. Yeah. Little Richard. The Frankie Lyman, he who was the Michael Jackson of that time. Frankie Lyman was this kid. Right. This is a story I share because Frankie Lyman was the first teenage superstar. Mm-hmm. And he was black. He, yeah. he had wrote a song at 12 years old called Why Do Fools Fall in Love. Yeah. Lawrence Tate had played him in the movie. Yes. This guy could do everything. He was the Michael Jackson of his time. And I saw them all. Now here's the but here's the catch. That's when the dream was conceived. Right. But it took me 30 years to bring that dream into reality. Because when I left that theater that night and I began to boast to my cousin yeah. about, I'm going to be like Alan Freed. I'm going to be the next Alan Freed. Well, my cousin was my hero. He was 19 or 20. I was 10. He said, he said you better quit acting like a fool. You talk like a damn fool. Ain't no black people in radio. That's a white boy's game. They ain't let you in radio. Your game is out here in these streets, man. Hustling. I said, well, what do you mean hustling? He said, hustling. That's how I got these nice clothes. He's always dressed. He was cleaner than the Board of Health. Yeah. Always sharp. 
always had a pocket full of money and a fine lady. And they drove cars. Right. The only people where I grew up had them nice cars and sharp clothes were the preachers and the pimps. Right. I mean, that's the truth. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Yeah, that's reality. Yeah. So all through my life, I kept hearing that's a white man's game, not a brother's game. Right. I said, there are black people in radio. I started bringing up some names like Frantic Ernie Durham and uh, out of Detroit and Martha Jean McQueen and, 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 and of course, uh, 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 oh, there's, uh, uh, a couple other ones out of Memphis. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, that's the, those are little stations. But you, they, your chances are, are, are very slim. It ain't going to happen. So he, I end up that same night hustling. Yeah. But I kept hearing all this. You see, environment. It's a bad thing. Sure. If you got people around you that are naysayers and haters and doubters and you keep listening to them. That's right. You can, they can destroy your dream. That's why it's mentally tough enough. You have to be mentally tough to, to, to block that, to get them out of there. And that's what I had to learn over the years. I did not have a game plan. Right. I didn't know what the heck. I knew what I wanted. I didn't know how to get there. Right. I, 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 I didn't have a game plan. I didn't set goals in that area. And third, most likely, I didn't believe what happened. I was just some little black dude out of Windsor, Detroit area that, uh, you know, I mean, nobody, you know, I never had the, I never even believed that that could happen to me. Right. And then one day I was talking to Muhammad Ali, true story, and we talked about things, and I told him about Otis Redding, and I told him how much Sam Cooke was his best friend. And his, I started talking about the history of Sam Cooke, the history of Otis Redding, the history of Wilson Pickett. And Muhammad always looking at me like he said, man. And then I told him, I want to be, uh, I want to be in radio one day. And that was in the 60s, remember, 1966. Yeah. He said, why aren't you in radio? I said, because uh, they, don't, they don't like black people in radio. It ain't worth it. And he said, listen, man. He got serious. He said, listen, man. I'm glad Jackie Robinson didn't think like that. Man. And Jack Johnson didn't think like that. He said, man, if you want something, you got to fight for it. Right. Ain't nobody going to give you nothing. You got to fight for it. He said, You got a talent there, man. You could really do it. You got personality. And then he promised that he'd be the first one uh, I could interview. Oh, wow. But he wasn't. The first one I interviewed was Chubby Checker. He did the twist. Uh, yeah. Come and on. Then Tina, and then Tina Turner. Yep. And then Brenda Lee. And then Muhammad Ali. And then uh, back to my, my career, I got a chance to open up and work with Bill, Bill Clinton and, uh, uh, oh, geez, and Smokey Robinson. Yeah. Uh, Frankie Valley and of the Four Seasons. Uh, the circle. Gladys Knight. Uh, I got to meet all these people that, that I, Mark Wahlberg, uh, uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., and, and all these different people uh, uh, that um, I never dreamed would happen. And, and, and it was just a, a wonderful, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. And I'm still, I'm still involved. I'm just uh, finishing a book called The Predator Within. Uh, which talks about the predator that, uh, the psychological predator that gets in your head and just tears your dreams right. apart and, and, and devours them like a starving carnivore does uh, raw meat. And it's important that you get that predator out of your head. Yeah, that is. That it is. Amazing. This is Spider. I, I, I am so pleased that you, you've taken the time uh, uh, to chat and to share. Uh, like I said, you know, you... you Lived your life uh, again, chasing your dreams, going after things that you wanted, and and the fact that you now take those and and share with other people have been phenomenal. So I really, really appreciate you you sharing your story. Um, for people who want to connect with you, you met, I know you said your website. I want to say that again? They can pick up a copy of your book and find out other things you got going on. What well, five things you can do? First of all, you can reach me at my website, which is. Uh, uh, spiderjones.com or you can email me spiderjones at rogers.com and one thing I want to say before I go it's very important I think, do not give up on your dreams Right. you're going to run into obstacles and challenges but stay focused and, 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 and you train Look, don't let your dream intimidate you Take it one goal at a time, like building a building. You start with the foundation and then a brick and a brick, and pretty soon you got this beautiful building. 
never give up on yourself, no matter where you come from, no matter how tough things look. Look at Oprah. Look at Viola Davis. Now, there's so many of them. We could share, Maybe next time I'll share some stories uh, with other people that have made it that came from absolutely nothing. Right. Right. Thank Amazing. you for having me. No, I appreciate it, Spire. Thank you so much. And uh, again, to our listeners, uh, you got it. Here's Spider Jones, man. Take care, Spider. Thanks. Bye-bye. We are the creators of our own dreams. And whether they're big or small, we can fulfill anything we want in life simply by going after them. I'm so inspired by those individuals who throw caution to the wind and choose happiness by going all in on their dreams. We all know this to be true, but we've only got one life. So why not make it a life of fulfillment by choosing to be a dream chaser? We'll obviously need some tools at our disposal, courage, faith, belief, and the ability to take risks. But having said all that, I can promise you that if you choose to be a dream chaser, you'll never live with regret ever. That's it for me. Thank you so much for joining the Audacious Living Podcast. I'm Oddly Stevenson. And until next time, be safe, be kind, show love, and be audacious. You've been listening to the Audacious Living Podcast, hosted by Audley Stevenson. If you enjoyed what you heard, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, be audacious.